All right, next up on the agenda here at the shop is to get my Cincinnati HydroShift engine lathe up and operating. So this is one of the machines that I got when I saved all those machines from that abandoned machine shop, that rundown one with all the old machines. This is by far the newest machine that was there. Funny thing is, is this was the one that I wanted the least at that time. Well, it turned out to be really the gem out of all of them. This Cincinnati here, um, it had some grinding in the head when I initially basically turned it on. The hope is, is that when I, I took the top off there and it was pretty low on hydraulic oil. So we'll see, I'm gonna definitely try and get that gone through before I get any further, but I did clean up all the ways and man, this thing is just butter smooth. This machine is in amazing shape. The ways, the, the gears, everything other than when I power it up, I don't get full power to each one of the different RPMs when I change this dial here. This is a Hydra Shift, H-Y-D-R-A Shift, Hydra Shift. It's a 17 by 54 and it is an awesome lathe, but I'm pretty sure we don't have enough. This is supposed to be an oil gauge um, that you can see into the head. Can't read it, it's too, you know, there's a lot of crap on it from just years of sitting. So 
I'm pretty sure we don't have enough oil in it. The biggest reason I haven't just thrown more oil in it is in this electrical panel, there is a whole bunch of like some sort of leakage from something else. And I don't know if it's oil coming out of the head somehow getting into there, or this machine did have coolant. I think that the coolant pump is on the other side of this. There's a, a panel where you can access the, um, the actual coolant tank. I don't know if it's back here somewhere. I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember. I, I'm not even sure if it's still on this machine. But my biggest thing is I don't want to use the, I don't want to fill up the head with oil and then have it all leak back out into the electrical panel and just end up, you know, completely making a mess. Not to mention the oil that goes in this is very expensive and I don't want to do it twice. So it's just kind of sat here. All that's really been done is cleaning. Uh, we've cleaned the heck out of it. We've detailed the body. We've detailed the ways. We've, we've gotten all of the... Uh, all of the mechanisms for the carriage working, the cross slide, everything spinning freely and moving well. I made this little wood protector to kind of just, you know, keep the ways in good condition, not to mention sometimes we'll set and kind of use this as a workbench a little bit, um, and that'll protect that. One thing we need to do is pull this, this chip pan out, pressure wash the heck out of it, and then clean everything else i haven't cleaned the screw or the inside of the ways or you know whatever there's a pretty much the back side of it i did however find some chucks for it this is a three jaw what is that a bernard chuck 151 something one made in england great chuck i have inside and outside jaws for it for the actual chuck I picked up another uh, backing plate with an L1 taper, and then I picked up this chuck with an L1 taper. And an L1 taper is basically this here. What you see is it tapers in, and it has a big large key, and then there's a large nut that threads on these threads. Biggest problem with this chuck is it's larger bigger through hole, etc. But I only have these jaws. The other set of outside jaws, I didn't come with it. And I don't know if I'll ever find them. Um, see if I can find a maker. There it is. This is a, a Skinner Chuck Company, number 3812 L1-49 made in New Britain, Connecticut. And so if you have or know where I could find a set of outside jaws for this chuck for a number 3812 L1-49, that would be amazing because that would take this chuck and literally give it the way more capacity compared to the chuck that's on it. The chuck that's on it is smaller, but because of the fact that it has outside jaws, it has a larger capacity to hold a bigger thing than the other one. Other than the fact that the through hole is smaller. So that limits what can be put in it right there at the throat anyway. This is a four jaw for it, but it's not the kind of four jaw that you'd normally want. This is a concentric four jaw, meaning all four jaws move together just like they do on a three jaw chuck. So it's nothing really than a novelty. I mean, it's a big monster heavy chuck that, you know, each jaw doesn't move independently like I thought it was gonna. I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. I should have. They had another three or four jaw chuck that was, now that I know it was independent of one another. So I may try and go back. It's been a while since I got these, but I bet you they don't even have it anymore. I'm starting to get semi-tooled for this lathe. I still do have the original chuck that came with it, which is this Jacob's spindle chuck, which if you haven't seen one of these before, essentially the way it works is it's got this little lock and this thing spins and it unscrews this collar. That comes off 
and then has these rubber collets. This is the largest of the collets fitting down into that taper right there. And that allows you to basically put something in there and you would literally tighten it back down and the rubber and the metal in there would grab on real gently and real concentrically to the workpiece. The beauty of this spindle chuck, if you have all the pieces, is that there's a whole set of different sized rubber collets that go with it. And so I have the entire set, there's five in that box, should be six in that box with this one. And then basically you um, have these that sometimes if you need to have a little bit of support on the back side, you'd put the corresponding one in the back side of it. Um, and then you have something like that, like there. And then it's not squeezing the back of it more than the front of it. And so these are really nice, but they're very specialized. And a normal three jaw is really the majority of what I'm going to need. Um, I don't intend on getting rid of this thing because, you know, this is a useful, um, a useful chuck. It fits this. It's an L1 taper. It came with it. And I think that if somebody knew that there was a, a little storage compartment there and they had found it, they, th this chuck would have been gone. They left it because they didn't think they had all the collets, all of the, the uh, basically the pieces that go in there and fit in there. And yet they were all, these two boxes and this manual completely oil soaked were, were in there, which I was pumped about. So I don't know how often we'll use that, but that is the original one. This is the one I currently have on it now. I did check it for run out. There's literally almost none at all. For now, I think what we need to do is we need to pull the chip pan out. We're gonna crib this thing up. We're gonna pull it out away from the uh, wall there and we're gonna get access to the back of it where we can get into the electrical panel and get at the electric motor. All right, we're gonna pull this lathe out so we can get access to it. All right, we're getting this thing looking nice. This is obviously the back side of it. But the Salvage Brothers, this is Ryan. <laughs> and this is Josh. Hello. Getting this thing all detailed, getting all the dirt and grease off of it, and making it look like a deservable machine. Now, what I'm working on right now, in this cabinet here, see this all right all that chipping paint it's like there was an oil leak in here up top nothing really you know it kind of looks pretty normal but as you come down here you see like even almost around that it's like there's a like like oil filled this tube up and just kind of, I don't know, started to fill up this cabinet. I'm not sure. And then this connection here, this was actually unscrewed. So this cable that goes from here to the motor was maybe disconnected long enough that all the oil drained out. I really don't know. I, I took, there's four bolts that hold the main panel to the box. I took those four bolts off. There's nothing behind there other than four bolts that hold the entire box to the machine. So there's no access for oil to come through that way. The only thing is these wires go down to this tube, this conduit, and they go underneath the head of the lathe. And they essentially lead to this panel here. And all this panel is, is your forward, reverse, and stop. So turn the chuck one way, turn the chuck the other way, and stop. 
And if you look in here, I don't see any oil leaking. I don't see any ingress location where you could possibly have oil come through. All I do see is the conduit and the wires. And so I counted the wires. There's one, two, three, four, five. Five wires coming into this panel through that conduit. And right here, if we count, we've got one, two, three, four, five. Five wires leave this cabinet, go through that conduit, straight into the button panel. So I am a little bit kind of perplexed in regards to what is happening and how this oil got in here. Here's the thing. What I am pretty sure on is that the head of this is low on oil. And I know for a fact there's been an oil leak of some kind here. And so I don't usually look at situations like that as a coincidence. Oh, well, they're just two totally separate, unconnected issues. Since the head's low on oil, and we have a bunch of oil in here, or we did at one point, it's now just rusty junk mixed with the paint from the box. It leads me to believe there's somehow there was a way that oil got into here. The only other thing I can think is possibly coolant was run. There should have been at one point, there would have been a coolant pump there. And I know, well, since I've gotten it, there wasn't, there isn't one. I do know that when I got it, we barely tapped the, the, the panel here and uh, busted a hole right through. So this whole bottom was full of water when I first picked this machine up. So there should have been a coolant pump there and it would have run, I don't know, to in here somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where it would have gone. Either way, I am only seeing those two options as potential for getting, uh, getting oil into this panel, either coolant or the oil out of the head somehow. So I guess the question for you guys is, is there a, some sort of a, I mean, I see a drain plug. Yeah, I see a drain plug right where my finger's at. Can't show you real well, I need to get a light. And then this pipe here runs down to this filter and then comes back up, feeds this pump, and then this pump pushes the oil back up to the head that way. So, I think the next step is gonna be, I'm gonna pull this head off, the cover for the top, and we're just gonna take a look in there and see if we can see anything. All right, I'm cleaning chips out of this thing, just kinda like stuff that's been here forever. And underneath the head, there are just mountains of chips. This thing was ridden hard and put away wet more than once. But better out than in, I always say. So we're gonna get all those cleaned out of there. There is no bottom in sight, more like in feel. All right, so when we clean machine tools, you don't really want to use a water-based product, mainly because the tolerances in these things are so tight. And if you have like a degreaser in here and it gets between the ways and you don't get it perfectly clean, which is very, very difficult, then what happens is rust starts to appear. So we use a light oil for the majority of the cleaning, mainly due to the fact that if it gets left in those spots, then we don't have to worry about any rusting happening. It just lubricates the moving surfaces. So just something I've been doing for a long time and I really, I think it works out well. All right, I've got all these unscrewed. Every one of these is the same length. 
except for the one right over the chuck is slightly longer. And then I don't know why, but that one there came out kind of rusty. All right, can you take that? Just go that way, put it on the front bench. Well, it looks nice in there. So that is the inside of a Hydra Shift Cincinnati lathe. It's fully hydraulic, essentially. All of the functions for changing the speeds are hydraulically driven. So it is dirty. Like, see all that dirt in there. I think the plan is going to be to clean up this top some. And then probably fill it up with diesel fuel. Run it, get everything freed up, then we'll drain it and potentially clean everything out in a way that we can get, um, ensure that we're not going to have any dirt flowing through it. And then we will fill it up with the right oil. All right. I want to clean in here. I think I can take this top head off. It's got the three shifter forks. There's four bolts here. And then there's a line there, here, here, and here. And I believe it'll lift straight up and off and it'll give us all kinds of access down in there. So let's just get to disconnect it and hope I'm not wrong. So there's that one. There's not a lot of oil in this thing. I've there's like a lower sump section down there that I see some oil, but up in that area I don't see much of any at all. We take this out. This out. This one. And this one. Just gotta be careful. Is that where is that line going? Or does that whole tube stay with it? This whole tube might stay with it. I can't tell. Those all four the same length. Okay, this side is longer. Yeah. About the same size. Okay, so closest to the chuck of the shorter side. Closest to the back side of the machine is the longer ones. Like my Danner boots. Yeah. There we go. I will say it is pretty dang good looking in there. So if we look at all of the gears, I mean, there is a slight bit of slight bit of dirt but down in here you can see there's some oil in that lower sump area I'm not sure what that is some sort of a pump or something but it's got some uh, metallic -y. not bad so what I'm really looking for here okay what's that 
you look right down there, there's a hole. You see it? Right there. You see that hole right in the middle of the screen? Where's that go? That is at the drain. Um, there is a plug over there. This is filter. Okay. It's this one. Okay. Goes in here. And then it goes comes, this. No, no, it doesn't go into that. It goes oh, out. Goes out. Okay. So that hole is where the oil goes down through to the filter, and then the filter brings up back up and comes through that line there, which probably one. comes up to this T and goes into that head and dumps down into that cup to feed those. Looks like there's some clutches back there. It doesn't look bad. I mean, there's no rust at all. There's corrosion in regard, well, I wouldn't even say, I wouldn't even say it's corrosion. I'd say there's just, just buildup and dirt. Really, really great thing to see. The one thing I definitely want to clean from the inside is uh, this oil level gauge. I can't see it from out, out here. All right, there's a little copper tube right here and it goes right down to that site level glass. Let's see if this cleans it. Clean? Keep going. Am I taking off oil level? I think so. Yeah, we are. Okay, so let's just note we need oil level at the middle. So I'll make an, a mark on the outside of the machine here, but at least we can get that clean enough to at, le at least use it. It's really all I can get, but way cleaner. And now we'll make a mark on the machine. All right, we're gonna open up this line here to the filter and see what we get. Not a lot. So let's take the filter housing. Open it up. Mm, a lot of that's the brake cleaner. Well, that is not much of a filter, dang. Huh. Yeah, that is literally just like a screen. No big chunks in there. I mean, at least there's that. Um, yeah, that sticker's gone. I'd love to save it, but it's not going to make it. So... I guess the plan will be, hopefully we can reuse this rubber gasket. Where we'll clean these, so we got this little nut here from the bottom. Pretty sure it goes like that maybe. And then there's a bolt from the top. All right, I'm gonna get all these wiped out, cleaned out. Um, I was thinking I was gonna have to buy a filter for it, but I guess we'll just clean that screen. It does seem like there is a crack in it though. Right there. I don't know. It's a more like a major particulate filter, not just not necessarily a actual filter filter. All right, I didn't film it, probably should have, but I made a mess. So I had this drain plug pan there, and there's another drain plug right there. So this drain goes down to the filter. That one's just plugged, so there was some oil still in there, and 
There we go. And then, so this plug was there. So I opened it up and there's really no good way. It just, oil just went straight down onto this, all over here, got some in the pan, some under. So I'm using all this oil dry to catch it and clean it up. But I just wonder why, why is that not come down 90 over to a T and then T into this tube going down to the filter? Am I wrong in assuming that we want everything filtered or is there some reason that that lower sump is just has a drain plug? If you know or have any thoughts on that, let me know in the comments. I'm curious because it wouldn't be too hard for me to put in an elbow there, straight piece of pipe, and then a T straight down that would allow the oil from that sump to drain over T into this pipe and then come right down and hit the filter or screen or whatever we're going to call that and then go back up and get pumped back onto the top side of everything. All right, so here's what I'm thinking. To make that not a nightmare to change, I'm going to add this pipe here. So I've got an elbow that will screw up into that drain plug spot, a pipe over to a 90, and in that hole there, we'll put the original plug. So essentially it'll look something like that. And then that will be in a place that I can put a bucket right below that and catch everything. Now, you let me know your thoughts on, uh, on teeing all the oil over into this filter screen thing because that would be, seems right to me. I just, I'm not an expert and on this one I'm not sure how these Hydro shifts use the oil in the two sumps. Not even sure why there are two sumps, but not relevant. Let's go ahead and add this drain pipe extension. All right, so here's our drain extension. Got the 90 already in. There we go. plug we'll go right in there and we'll still be able to so the bucket essentially can get put right here this drain for the screened oil can still get access there and I'm pretty sure the carriage will be able to get all the way in not hit that and we won't have to worry about this electrical wire it's not gonna be a big deal and then our plug will essentially go right there and I'm just gonna tighten that without any uh, Teflon tape or anything. Pipe plugs are usually tapered slightly. Most pipe fittings are. So we'll leave it like this. And then we're gonna start putting some diesel into the base of that thing. Perfect. We've been working in this, uh, the head of the lathe here, kind of detailing with toothbrushes, and I've got about, I don't know, a few gallons of diesel in it. And you can see on the oil level here that we're right about there. So we're above halfway, above full, but it's looking pretty murky down there. But my plan, we're gonna put the head back on, 
with the shifting forks and everything, we're gonna power this thing up, let it pump that diesel through all of the passages and all of the cavities, and then run it for a short bit. That will clean out any additional dirt that's in all these copper tubes, in all these oilers, and then we'll come back and we'll drain it out the back. And that will give us, hopefully, a pretty dang clean um, head here on the hydro shift. So let's get that top back on. I have a feeling it's gonna kind of be a little bit of a pain because you gotta get all three of these shifting forks, one, two, three, onto, there's a gear right there. You see that little notch? There's a notch right there and a notch right there. And then you gotta line up it for these four bolts and then there's uh, obviously the copper tubes for for the fluid. So I'm gonna struggle, but I will succeed. Lift this corner up and we can stick this bar in there and try and get from there to here. one's in place this one's in place this one we need to lift up slightly to get on should be I think a 5 8 and a 9 16 all right I'm gonna get all these tightened down and we will get to Starting this bad boy up. All right, it's time to power this baby up. We've got the diesel fuel in the head, and I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that, so th pull this up, and that engages the, all right, we've got three phase on. We'll come back here, power this to on, and then we're in neutral. So if I remember right, this thing is a squealer. Let's just go ahead and give it a, oh yeah. In order to actually run this thing through the gears and speeds, I think we need to put the cover back on. It's going to make a huge mess in here. So I'm going to wipe this down. We'll get that top put back on. And then we can literally just go through every single one of the speeds and then give us the ability to make sure that fluid gets through every passage that it normally sends it through. And then we'll drain that diesel out and move on. The bearing in the back of this motor here is squealing really 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 bad after we get everything drained out of it we're going to go ahead and put new bearings in this motor i assume that's all it needs but it's not too hard to pull it off 
I think we've got like a handful of bolts on this side and then have to get these three belts off. few things figured out. I got the uh, the screw for the carriage re-engaged. This, this gear here had come, uh, come apart from this one, so it wasn't actually powering the carriage. So now we start it. All right, I think we've run this long enough with the diesel fuel in it. Let's take the cover back off. We'll drain the, all the diesel out of it and uh, get it prepared to put in the good oil. So still having issues with some of the shifting. I don't know if that matters. I think it might be that it needs oil, actual oil to run everything. So I'm not getting every one of these gears to actually operate um, the spindle when it needs to. So. But for now, let's get it drained and we'll go from there. So the more I look at this and seeing how much oil and stuff it flings, there was no gasket on this thing when I got it. There's no gasket on the top. I am betting it's missing a gasket. And instead of it having a leak down below, it literally just seeped the oil out everywhere over the time that it was uh, in service, eventually running out of oil. I don't know, it's probably not a good thing, but I do know that this looks so much cleaner than it did when we were first messing with it. All right, here's our extended drain plug. Well, I made a mess again. Spilled all over and I was trying to transfer. It's better with that drain plug, but I think what I really need to do is now is drop a straight pipe down to right here. And then I can just stick something under. Then I don't have to like try and hold it because it was splashing everywhere, making a big mess. Brian, we get some of that oil dry. But this is some dirty, really dirty diesel. So that is absolutely great thing to see. That's that is all the junk that's been in that the head of that thing. So that's the one side. I'm gonna disconnect and open up this one and we'll drain that out and get get the rest of it out all right well we've got that all draining and kind of dripping out before we go any further i want to address the bearings in this motor so i think to get the belts off that motor there's four bolts here holding that motor to the to the machine you loosen these these three with the the little tracks and then the fourth one's where it pivots so the whole motor will pivot that way and then you can take this belt and the three main drive belts off. This bump belt here is for the uh, oil pump. And then you undo all four bolts all the way and we can pull the motor that way. Um, I'm also gonna take off the head again. I'm gonna look up exactly where everything should be when we uh, have it in neutral so that I can install it exactly how it should be so that each one of these clicks is exactly where at the RPM it should be, and I don't know for sure that I have it correct. So I'm gonna verify that, but right now we're gonna work on getting that off. Uh, 
else but garbage. Oh, my fucking good. That almost looks bad. Alright, so now let's make sure everything's out of the way over there so we can get the motor out. Your pipe's in the way. Okay. It should be free. Put it down on my leg. Okay. All right, so we've got the motor on the bench. I took the, the fan shroud on the back off, got the pulley off. Let's open it up and see what we're working with here. It's a completely sealed motor like there is no openings at all other than the shaft that spins through the middle of it no air openings anywhere my bet is it's for you know situations where there's a lot of oil chips grease dirt they don't want all that stuff getting into the electric motor so let's pop this thing open and see what we're dealing with as far as mo uh, i want to figure out what the bearings are so we can replace them Oh my so goodness. Much for air tight. Wow. Seriously for air tight. How is this even working? Holy mother. I've opened up a lot of electric Ooh, you like my glasses? I've opened up a lot of electric motors and that thing is furry. Wow. I don't even know if the growl is the bearings. It might be all this crap. Holy crap. <laughs> just look at it. Would you just look at it? Look at this. You want me to get a vacuum? Yeah, get the vacuum. Let's see if we can save this motor. I mean, I know we can. Wow. I'd say water definitely got in this old dog. I don't think this is affecting anything majorly with the, the lathe, though, other than the growl sound coming from the motor. I have opened up a lot of electric motors. I don't even know how this was making power. Every one of those grooves between those slants 
should be clear of any debris or many times you won't even get the circuit to be completed. Well, I think it's safe to say that we needed to get in here for more than just the uh, bearings, but uh, yeah, that's nuts, really. There's tons more debris down the bottom. Every one of these should be a clear passage for air to flow around. And I got most of them freed up. This one's still got a bunch of white gunk in it. That's okay though. It works. So I can't really, well, that's not true. I could probably mess it up more, but I'm not going to mess it up more. We'll get this cleaned up. So I already opened this. <laughs> so these bottom two bolts would not come out. And I took some heating and some impacting. But as you can see, as evidenced by the cocaine that has decided to spill out over the uh, bench here, we have a surprise. You ready? Oh my goodness. Would you look at that? <laughs> Again, I really don't think I've ever seen that in an an engine i'm sorry you're gonna give me crap if i call it an engine in an electric motor that actually works what in the world are we dealing with here i don't know but let's get the vacuum and let's uncover the treasures that abound us here in this uh wonderfulness I see, uh, we have some exposed. Pretty much every one of these wires in here is exposed. Uh, yeah, the, the outer sheathing is just cracking off. Oh, didn't get it all. I'm gonna cut that, make ourselves a line. Anyone care for a line? Oh yeah, there it is. So, let's see, we gotta clean this box out. I've gotta figure out a way to protect these wires. I'm betting in this sheath a little further down, there's some good enough wire to use. I'm just seeing all the wires coming out of the actual electric motor here are not great to say it nicely. Now we could pull them apart, throw some shrink tubing after over each one, and that's probably what I'm gonna end up doing. I just gotta figure out, because of all these wires, there are only three of them coming into this case, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 wires in this box. So one, two, three, four different, uh, so we've got to be, yep, we are wired low voltage, so, which means we are, we are wired correct. But, all right, well, surprises never end. I wasn't expecting it to be this bad. I knew there was going to be some corrosion in here, but goodness gracious. I'm going to keep uh, chipping away at this incredible mystery.
The mystery being why and how did this engine or this motor run? How, how in the world? I just don't get it. But I have to believe it because we all just watched it run. So you have to believe it too. It's astoundingly pretty amazing in the truest sense of the word. Awe-inspiring. All right, suction. I think that all of that corrosion was just like a beautiful little pillow around all of these wires. And because this machine didn't move much, it didn't matter. As long as you didn't disturb it, it worked. We have disturbed it. I have got to figure out how to protect all these wires from each other, all while not ruining or figuring, having to figure out which wires are what. Because there is almost nowhere I can see that I can actually uh, see numbers. So I'm going to have to take these apart one by one, shrink tube them, and put them back together. Getting all the all the pieces cleaned up and assembled, ready to go back together. When we opened up the motor housing, we had all that wonderful white powder from the aluminum corroding, but we also had most of the motor winding wires cracking and being exposed. So my plan is to shove shrink tubing down on each of them and just heat shrink them covered. Uh, I really don't want to spend the time or money to have somebody rebuild this. All in all, so far so good. I guess we go, we're going to try and get the motor fully cleaned out. We'll get that put back together in the machine itself and maybe we'll get all our gears back. We'll find out. But for tonight, it's getting late and we're going to call it a night. Come back tomorrow. Yeah, that thing's had some water. Oh. Yeah, that's dry as heck. It's barely turning. Yeah. Definitely need to replace that one. Well, at least these bearings aren't stuck on there. They're coming off real easy. not any better maybe a little bit better but garbage so the wires on this thing now that we opened it up you see there's the, the coating there is cracking and I know they're not great but it was running fine so the plan is to take shrink tubing this is double wall with adhesive on the inside it shrinks down three to one and we will slip it over this all the way up into the motor housing like so and then shrink it on there and that'll hopefully protect it it's going to take some time to get it all done better than nothing i i really don't want to pay the 600 to a thousand dollars to get this motor rebuilt or rewound i guess so we're going to do what we can to save it especially since it was already running and working so that's what i'm working on now it's going to be a tedious process but but worth it All right, one done, and uh, I think there's not eight more to go. Got all of these shrink tubed, and ran the shrink tubing through the motor. Got all of those as nice, as far in there to the, the motor windings as I could. Got the three leads for power. 
coming out of the conduit there got those all nicely labeled doesn't really matter usually with three phase for the most part you can hook up any one of the leads to any one of the three and it should work fine but i want to keep everything exactly how it was i am going to clean this motor a little bit more um i might run you know some sort of a wire wheel in here we'll get some more of the dust out I'm not going to do a ton to it so i've got new bearings for the actual shaft there so we'll get those put on we'll get rid of these we'll drop it all back together and we're going to put it back on and try it i think we're going to have a, a good running engine the hard part is is getting another one like this completely sealed identical is probably next to impossible so if this motor ends up having issues either i'll have it rewired or i'll literally just adapt a different motor to the machine to be able to run the machine but i I honestly think that we're going to be absolutely fine. I mean, we probably took five or ten pounds off of, you know, off the weight of the machine just due to all the junk we pulled out of it. As well as, but as, as well as, blah, 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 blah. as well as it was running before we took it apart, I really don't see any reason why it's not going to run well now, unless I messed up something here. But I really think I didn't. So let's get this all buttoned together. Is there a new bearing? There's the old bearing. we go two brand new bearings got these all shrink tube over the top of the nut and bolt so they won't contact each other I'm gonna get these all tucked in here all right got it all cleaned out in there the wire wheel got most if not Probably 90% of the junk out of it. The wire's all ready to go. So let's put this motor back together. Beautiful. No noise. There's a couple shims. Just gonna try and leave those in the case. we go perfectly silent no growling no grinding no 25 pounds of whatever the heck was in that thing so now I'll put this key back in That side's all done. All right, here we go. Perfect. Totally quiet. You don't hear the motor at all. Spins freely. 
That fan doesn't touch the case. Now all we have left is the rear cover. Goes on something like that. All right, so next up, we're gonna stab this thing back in there. I am betting to get the belt off of this, you probably have to pull that out, pull this out, and then loosen these two. Mm. And you can move the whole thing just slightly closer. Yeah. And I don't want to ruin the new belt, but and this pump actually feels good. Nice and smooth. That motor feels good. It's silent. We'll see if it makes power. <laughs> So I'm looking around, digging around in this, the head of the lathe here, and I'm trying to find anywhere I think something doesn't look right. Well, this gear here, not only does it move freely, but it spins. And so you can move it side to side and spin it. That just seems wrong. So I'm feeling around down here, and I feel right below it two things we have we have a roll pin and we have a key for a keyway come to find out this this gear should be pinned there's a hole right there should be pinned and keyed to this shaft here to the shaft that this gear's on. I'm thinking that we lost a lot of gears due to that roll pin failing. If this keyway is in and the roll pin is in as well, then the key can't come out. If the roll pin falls out, all this thing has to do is move far enough over and that the key itself can walk its way right out. I think simple solution is we put the key back in I tried the key or tried the roll pin. The roll pin is way too loose. So I can just insert it. It'll go in and out. No problem. So my plan is going to be to replace that with a thicker, newer one and then reuse this key. I am probably about 90% sure. That's why I got such a deal on this machine. I think they knew that this machine was junk or not working or they had no idea what was wrong with it and it took someone like me to actually dive in start cleaning it find its issues um to be able to actually diagnose and fix the problem i am not really worried about it at all i i've seen no evidence of anything being broken not the easiest to tell but that shaft right there has gotten hot and it started to blue and maybe lose some of its hardness i don't know if it's a big deal, I really don't think so. And I think some of the grinding, some of the long serrated marks on that that gear there, the one that's that came unpinned and unkeyed, I think those are just from maybe just junk getting in there and kind of wearing. It also could be the factory finish, although looking at some of these other ones, like like these right down here, I don't think that's the factory finish over there on that one, but you know, if you look at this factory finish on these two, it's not perfect. You do see the serrated marks um, of the turning tool, but it isn't as bad as that gear that came unkeyed. So I guess the solution here for the short term is to replace the roll pin, reinstall the key, and then maybe go with it. The only other issue I see is right, right there, there's a bearing that is slightly protruded and slightly sticking out of the case that way. And I don't know if it should be all the way up against. I mean, on the other side, there's actually a nut. So it almost leads me to believe it's where it should be. Um, I was trying to mess around trying to get this cover off because I'm betting these three covers are how you get the three main shafts 
and their and their gears out of the case i couldn't get it off um i got all the bolts out i just i don't want to break it so i think for right now i'm going to put it back together and simple solution is just put the put the key back in new roll pin and then we'll just try it so this is the roll pin that fell out in the head allowing the key to come out and essentially made it so one of the gears on the intermediate shaft wasn't fixtured and could just float freely i've got my roll pin assortment here we're going to dig through this this is very important that this is the right length because this pin goes into a blind hole and what a blind hole is essentially it's a hole that there's no other side to it blind holes are largely used with bolts and things well the way this one works is it's pounded in and then you leave it flush with the gear and say you need to take it apart later you pound it all the way in to the center shaft that eliminates the connection between the gear that you're attaching to that center shaft and then you pull the gear off and that center shaft has a through hole going all the way through that allows you to then punch this all the way through the outside because the gear itself only has one hole it doesn't have one on the other side this pin is not holding it it it's very loose in there so i think it's in this size range here obviously that's too long but it's important that it's the right length for the fact that it has to be able to punch into that center shaft and if it doesn't then we're up shit creek and you know drilling and grinding and whatever so this is kind of like my kit that i've put together throughout the years a lot of these are just miscellaneous um roll pins i've gotten here and there and then these are some new old stock doorman ones in the boxes but looks like it's in this size range those look right yep so that's the pin that came out of it right here those two those two look to be right there's another one keep it separate That one looks about the same. So I'm going to pick one that looks the least amount used. A couple of these do look kind of used, like that one does there. So we'll test fit it. And I think I'm actually going to put it in with some red Loctite. I don't see an issue with that. I do not know why the pin came out. So... The bigger problem may be something else is loose. I haven't found that culprit yet, but for now, the goal is to see if by putting this roll pin and that key back in, do we get all the gears back. So let's grab these, we'll go test fit them, we'll find one to replace that pin, and we'll see if it fixes our issue. Let me show you a little bit more what happened. All right, so this gear right there should be permanently fixtured to this intermediate shaft. This is the middle shaft. So that hole you see right there should have a roll pin in it. And I've already cleaned up and reinstalled the actual key for that shaft that, that keys it, fixtures it permanently to that intermediate shaft. So since this gear here was not permanently fixtured to that, that shaft, it allowed it to move and move even over this gear here and that in in a lot of situations made it so that certain gear ratios were not even able able to happen because that gear was in the way so now all we got to do is put a roll pin in that hole i just cleaned it with brake cleaner blew it out with air and we're going to throw it in with some red loctite and see what happens now that we figured that out we can i guess move on um so let's get that pin in and we'll go from there i don't even know how much this is it gonna really even help but it'll make me feel better
There we go. Got it flush. With the gear there. Should be good to go. I think we're ready to start putting the head back together and giving it a try. We've got the whole head put back in with the shifting forks. The only thing that I am absolutely concerned about, probably shouldn't be, but is getting the right gear lined up with this selector. I've been through the manuals. There's no real procedure for essentially making sure that you have these in the right place. I, I don't exactly know. You're supposed to have moved all of these forks all the way to the right side and then put it in whatever gear that is and then tape the selector so it won't move. I didn't do any of that. And so I don't know if there's any procedure for making sure that these selectors are in the right place for this gear shifter. Because when this is out, this selector can just kind of freewheel. It's just a gear on a shaft that engages to another gear on a shaft on this head. So I think what I can do is once it's running, if I'm off, say neutral turns out to be 190, I'll have to loosen these four bolts, lift it up just slightly, and then I can turn the gear on the head, however many clicks I need to, in the correct direction, and then put this on neutral, and then set it back down and check it again. I think that's what I'm gonna have to do to kinda get it all lined up. So whatever, we are gonna fill the head with a cheaper hydraulic oil. It is an ISO 68. Um, I have a much better mobile light oil for this, but the plan is I want to run this oil through, kind of flush out the diesel. There was a little die grinding I did on the keyway, trying to get the, the key into that gear so that we could uh, reattach that, that gear on the shaft. So we're going to run it with this for, you know, 10, 20 minutes, about the same kind of deal we did with the diesel fuel, and then we'll drain it again assuming everything's working the way it should then we'll put the good oil in because the good oil oil is expensive this stuff is much cheaper i don't know i i'm really optimistic that we got everything kind of figured out that was wrong with it we'll see if the uh, if the motor turns on and runs beautifully we'll see if we've got all the gears and shifting let's just get right in to put some oil in it As I'm pouring this in, I'm trying to pour it all over all of the gears, all the shafts that move, anything that needs to be lubricated. So we want to be right in the middle of that sight glass. Right there. All right, so let's turn the three phase on by doing that on the power to the back of the box. All right, we should be live. Let's see if we uh, make sure we're in. Spindle is disengaged. <laughs> well, it runs. <laughs> Well, neutral is not the gear, and if we run it like this, we're going to make a big mess, but...
Okay, well, we know a couple things. We know the motor sounds beautiful and it still works. So it's not grinding. The bearing solved that. Cleaning that thing out was a big deal. And every time I selected a different speed, it changed. Now, obviously, we don't quite know if it's going to engage. And I don't want to keep engaging it and just having a shower of fluid here. So uh, let me show you exactly how the shifting works. Let's start this. So we've gone through every gear. You see how those shifting mechanisms work. Every time you shift a gear, it hydraulically moves these three levers, which in turn moves the gears down in there to get to the right gear you need. And all of these copper lines are all oilers. So there is an auxiliary or a little hydraulic pump right down in the case here. And then there's the main one on the side where we replace the green belt. The main one on the side feeds up here and basically goes into this control block and it feeds the head. And all of these lines are then basically engaged to, at, at certain times, spray extra fluid on certain gears in certain speeds. Um, and so the other little pump, I'm not exactly sure what it does, but I'm pretty sure it just gives additional fluid on the back side. So far though, everything is looking great. Um, everything's moving well, everything sounds good. Um, yeah, this is looking awesome. So I'm gonna wipe this down. We're gonna put the top back on it and then we can shift the speeds and figure out where our neutrals are because there's actually two. There's one here, one on the other side. We think that it's a high and a low speed neutral. I actually honestly, don't know if it really matters, um, but whatever. We got to figure out where those are and determine how we get our speeds right. So we're going to set this on here with no gasket. I need to get some more gasket material and then we'll make a new gasket for it. But for now, we just want to run it, check it, test it. back on. Let's power it up. So 
I'm not sure what speed we're in. I know for sure we're not in neutral. There's neutral. At least one of them. So the way you're supposed to shift these, if it works correctly, you shift it while the spindle is engaged. And it should not shift until after you disengage the spindle. Like that. That has got to be, that has to be 25. I think we are 180 and one spot out. That's got to be the slowest. So if we go to the other neutral, if we go over to 34. Now we disengage the spindle, break it, should shift. And then you want to slowly bring it up. All right, 25 is neutral. Let's go ahead and try all these speeds. So we'll shift it. We'll go to neutral. Go back up. There's our neutral. I think this is this next one, 980, this next spot here, I think that's gonna be the fastest speed. Yep. This one should be neutral. Yep. And this one should be low and slow. So far, we're getting every gear, every speed. There we go. Every one of them works. Yeah, buddy. I'm so pumped about that. We just took this machine from being completely useless to running like a top. Shifting exactly how it should. At the high speeds, I hear some grinding over here on this end but we'll look at that later. All right, so here's a diagram of the speed dial. Essentially, you've got a neutral on either end, and then you've got your low speeds and your high speeds. So right now, our neutrals are here and here at 190 and at 25. So currently, the way it's set up is this neutral here is 130, on back. So then we got 94, 68, 48, 34, and 25, which makes this side of it 
yeah, 190, 258, 360, 518, 700. The fact that this neutral is wrong is what was throwing me. And then that neutral is 980. So we are basically 180 out and one notch. So I can count that and I can know that when I take this head back off, I have to lift that off and I have to twist the gear inside the actual head with the shifter forks. We have to move this neutral here that sits next to the 190 down here. So we have to open up the head, undo the bolts, the gear in the head, I need to twist it. One, two, three, four, five, six rotations, six places essentially of where the gear actually sits. And that will bring our neutral down here for that's sitting next to the 190. And it literally takes these gears, puts them on the other side, brings that neutral down here up to this side, and then we'll have all of the gears correct on this dial. Before I go doing that though, I'm gonna see if I can, if there's anything in this gear here on this shifter inside, I can just pull the dial off, put the dial in a different spot. That might work, don't know. But that's kind of the situation we're in. We're just figuring out as we go. So you can see all the oil that's kind of leaked already back behind that head from the fact that there's no gasket. So I definitely believe that our missing oil in this machine happened due to the fact that somebody put it back together with no gasket on the head and over time running it, it just leaked it all out. Hopefully it didn't run anything too hot that it threw this thing out of true. But I guess for right now, we're just trying to get it mechanically working and we'll check all the how accurate the lathe is once we get to the point where we're happy with it. All right, so I've got the, the shifting head pulled up. It has this little spring-loaded, basically, pawl that keeps the gear from moving. So it, it kind of moves like this, and it has a little, little uh, thing right at the bottom, right there, that engages with one of those teeth. All right, so... We're currently at 25 on the dial, and we need to go six clicks that way, which would be one, two, three, four, five, six. That gets us to that neutral, and this dial will just spin, and that's kind of what got me off. So we want to be on that neutral on the dial, but that also means I need to move that gear six clicks that way. I guess it would be this way, but it has to turn that way. So there's one click. Two clicks, three clicks, four clicks, five clicks, six clicks. Okay, so now we want to lower it. Okay, it is locked into neutral. So let's bolt this back down and we'll, we'll try it again. So I made a mistake. I did six turns on that gear, but I also did six turns on this, which basically canceled one another out. So I'm gonna do it again. And I actually don't think I even need to move that gear. I can just move the dial. Try that. Thank you. 
Yeah, beautiful. All right, I went through all the high gears and back to neutral. Now we're gonna go 25 on up. So this next gear should be our slowest gear. Oh, and slow. Shift to 34. Stop the spindle, break it. 48. Neutral. Beautiful. Every gear works. The dial is now correct. Yeah, I am excited. So I think I got a couple things going on here. This belt is not tight all the way, so I need to tighten the small belt up. And then in the high gears, there's some sort of a noise on this end. I'll show you. So this will be 980. It sounds like there's some sort of a bearing in here that's going bad. I think that whatever gear bearing this has inside this collar here is, is not any good anymore. So that'll be an easy you pull this nut off, I believe, and the whole thing should come off. Yeah, but all in all, man, we are uh, leaps and bounds beyond where we were when we started here. She runs. All right, I'm kind of messing with this gear, trying to figure out what the what's going on. It doesn't have a roller style bearing. Um, it literally just has a bronze bushing. So there's this little nut, goes into this little cover. And then there's a bolt that goes through this arm right there that the nut threads onto. So that bolt can move like that so it can adjust to this gear and this gear. And then on the back side of this, you have that bronze bushing in there riding on this surface that that nut basically centers onto. So ideally this should not spin and also shouldn't make contact when this is all the way tight. So it might be a little tight there, I'm not sure. The other thing, I mean this bushing that bearing surface does not look bad at all. And it's very, very, very tight, which is what you want. No play, but yet loose enough to use. I feel like I'm missing a piece. So if I crank that down, like that, start it. I'm gonna put it in uh, the highest gear. made a little difference when I undid this nut, but if I leave it that way, then it's just going to back its way off. Um, I'm wondering if maybe I'm a little too tight up against this gear. So 
That is an adjustment between this and this. Well, it was a little bit better. I had it tight so that you didn't even have that kind of play. And it'll go tighter. I think it should be tighter, but I think it was making noise right at these two gears. I don't know. We'll have to measure the run out. We'll have to see if it actually matters. I think it does, or it will, but... Is it going to be good enough for me? Probably. Well, what do you think of the old Hydra Shift? This thing is not only looking amazing, and I am probably about 90% positive this is the original paint, this gray. This machine, for its age, being built in 1959, is in incredibly good shape. Um, I think it sat for a lot of years because that key fell out of the head and the gearing went away, and then for whatever reason, it got water or something into the electric motor there. So we fixed the motor, got that all cleaned up with the bearings replaced, brand new belts, all four of them there. Still got a tension, the smaller one a little bit more because it's kind of slipping a bit. Something's going on in this area with this gear in regards to creating some noise, which I think will end up affecting the accuracy of parts because it will come through the headstock. But I'll deal with that later. For now, we got it clean. It's completely operational. Every function works. We need to get a, a gasket made for this uh, top cover because this machine had almost no oil in it when I got it. And I truly believe that most of it leaked out around the edges, seeped down the whole head throughout the years. And then eventually it had no oil in it left, which maybe that led to something happening with the intermediate shaft there where that key came out of the gear. I'm not sure. Um, I know right now I'm not too worried about that. I would kind of be curious if anyone has any ideas why that key would have come out, why that roll pin could have fallen out. Maybe that gear got hot enough that it expanded enough the roll pin could just fall out. Once that happened, that keyway wasn't really being held by much. And all the mechanisms moving side to side could easily have kicked that, that uh, key out. But... The goal here is to get this machine operational and usable, just like the mill there. So at least these two main machines are ready to rock and roll for all of the heavy equipment and all of the other machine repairs that I need to do to all these machines we've been rescuing. All right, we got the lid here for the lathe, and we're going to make a quick gasket for it because I truly believe one of the issues this thing had was it was leaking all the oil out. And when I got it, never had a gasket on this surface. But before we do that, we're gonna run a file across all these surfaces. Actually, let me get this out so I can lay it flat. So we're gonna run a file just kinda like this. And as long as you're putting pressure on two different flats, you'll stay pretty parallel. And we're gonna try and knock off any, any burrs and clean it up just a slight bit, then we'll hammer out a new gasket.
All right, I've got this bolted through all the holes, so it shouldn't move. So we're gonna we're gonna hammer out the middle. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you make a gasket that is unobtainium. So, got that made. And that should fix all of our oil leak problems. So I'm really pumped about that. All right, I got this all cleaned up. In order to keep the gasket in place, we're gonna use a little grease. It'll also take up any imperfections in the castings and help it seal better. This is my absolute favorite way to make a gasket. You get the gasket perfect. It fits exactly how it should. There's no excess hanging out. It's quick. It's faster than scissors. It's faster than a utility knife. All you really need is a ball peen hammer and maybe a knife just for some trimming, but a ball peen hammer would do all this all by itself without a knife. Let me get this on there. And hopefully that seals up for us. Let's come down with it. All right, we'll do a quick test, make sure everything works right. Got it in neutral, nothing should happen. We'll go all the way up to 980. All right, I'm not seeing any more leaks. So I think the gasket definitely sealed and it's back on neutral. 
There we go. All right, well, I'd say that gasket definitely made a big difference. So we've got no oil leaking around the head at all. Every gear, every uh, speed selection works perfectly. You should be able to twist this while it's running and not have it shift until after you disengage and brake it. So once you use the brake and you slow it down and get it to stop completely, then it sees a pressure drop. And when it sees that pressure drop, it goes ahead and shifts to whatever you selected on the dial here. And I didn't have to set any of the pressures in there. There is a procedure in the manual for doing that. Um, I was fully expecting to have to do that, but it is functioning 100%. So I'm not going to worry about that at all. I really think at this point, we need to get it nice and hot. We're going to change the oil and put in a much better oil. And we needed to make a cut with it. We need to make something. My thought is to... You know, just see what it can do. Probably gonna have to do more of this. I'd like to add a DRO to it. I'd like to add, you know, coolant possibly. There's some a few other attachments I'd like to have. Um, but for right now, I just wanted to get it operational. I do need to find, I would really like to find a steady rest for it. I don't have a steady rest that works on this lathe because uh, I have some things I need to work on that a steady rest would be really useful for. Let's just keep going forward with it and we'll get it ready to use. Not real happy with that surface finish. I think we're gonna speed it up a little bit and try and take another cut and see what that does. We're running at uh, 360 RPM. This is mild steel, so you typically wanna be around 400. The next one up will take us to 518. So it'll be a little bit faster, but we'll see how it goes. Much better. Much smoother.
All right, there we go. Simple tool we made here was a stepped punch. Each and every one of these is a different diameter and just gives you the ability to use this in different settings, punch things out of holes, deep recessed in a thing. I threw a quick knurl on the handle just for some grip. And yeah, from a piece of uh, scrap iron to now a useful tool that I can throw in the bench, throw in the toolbox and have uh, with me anywhere I wanna go. I think we've proven that the lathe works. It still needs some fine tuning. I still need to go through the carriage. I need to go through the apron, a um, few other things. Got to change the head oil over to the good oil. And I mean, that, that motor, whisper quiet now. Absolutely awesome. Things running great. There's a few little t odds and ends. For today, I think that's all I got for you. It's been a long process getting this old machine to where it is now, mainly because I've just got a million projects. But as is life, now we have a fully functional operational engine lathe that goes through all the gears and is 100%. I am totally pumped to have it between this and the milling machine that is not ruined. Man, there is almost nothing we can't make here at Salvage Workshop. So if you enjoy this kind of content, if you enjoy shop projects like this, definitely let me know in the comments. It helps me really determine the kind of videos that I put out here on the channel. Um, yeah, I've got a lot more like it. If that's something you want to watch, make sure you let me know. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you're willing. Beyond that, thank you for your time. I truly appreciate it. And I look forward to catching you guys on the next project here at Salvage Workshop. Take it easy.